Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Cook, um, who will talk about regular, regularized vacuum determinants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, thank you very much for this invitation. And, uh, please. A pleasure to be back in Bonn. I have been here a couple of times and it's really very nice city. Um, I'll be talking about regularized Freton determinants. Um, so, um, first of all, some of you may not know what is a Freton determinant, and um, then there's regularization that comes afterwards. So let me start a little bit, uh, sort of just to do some basic, uh, you know, algebra, uh, which will use, give you sort of a context of what kind of operators I'm going to consider. So um, if you have a matrix, Um, suppose it's just values in C, then you know you have eigenvalues um, and we repeat them according to multiplicity, so you have lambda 1, in this case up to lambda n. And then we have uh, what we know as a trace, and in the case of the matrices that's just the sum along the diagonal. And, um, then we also know that for matrices, that's the same as the sum of eigenvalues. So that's all fine, and we also can construct um, what we call the characteristic polynomial for that matrix. Now, in the context that we're going to look at, characteristic polynomial is not the right way, actually, to do that. It's more like we like to construct uh, what we call a Freton determinant. So it's actually identity <coughs> minus S times A. And uh, this is well defined for S in this case, complex plane, and it's equal to 1 minus S times lambda J. So from the zeros, we can read off uh, the eigenvalues of this um, matrix if we happen to know the zeros of this determinant. Now, um, there's ways of calculating this kind of. Um, determinant, which is, uh, there are several ways actually, but let's just be talking about one, which is that you may express this for as a sum, s to the n over n, and then trace a to the n. So that's something that appears in dynamical systems, and I'll explain a little bit later on why. And uh, this is taken to be all n from 1 and onwards. And then you realize that this doesn't quite make sense for all s anymore. This makes sense for s small. But then you know that it extends analytically to the complex plane, so it's an entire function. Now, this is sort of the standard uh, first year, well, perhaps not that part, but the uh, mathematics course at the university perhaps. But uh, there's another way um, to look at this, which is in terms of uh, decomposing the operator into rank one operators. So uh, decomposing. A into rank one operators. So what does it mean actually? It means that we um, we will actually not look at A in this form, but you rather write A as a sum, and then you have um, some vectors f k tensor l k. So I'm still looking at the same matrix. But I'm writing in a slightly different form. So fk here is uh, a vector in Cn. So you can think of it as a column vector. And then lk would actually be a linear form, so dual vector. Think of it as a, a horizontal vector. And then you can think of the trace as being calculated in the following way, that you simply take the trace of these individual rank 1 operators. So it's simply the sum of LK acting on FK. Now, um, some of you, I mean, I suppose a lot of you have already seen this before, but 
Anyway, let me just give you an, a little example. So, if you take, if you take, say, the matrix A, and you rewrite this as rank one, you could write it in several ways. But one way is like this. Uh, B D zero one like this. You can multiply this up to give you the same. And if you take the trace of A, that would be you simply invert this. And now it just gives you A in the first place, D so we come back to the usual place. <coughs> Okay, so why do we actually want to do this kind of uh, decomposition? Well, it is because we want to describe something which is going on in infinite dimensions, and then the matrix formulation as such is not so good. So uh, we'll be looking at what are called composition operators. So it's actually holomorphic composition operators. And then we taking, say, a simplified, um, some simplified examples because, say, the most general case is a little bit more complicated to explain. Um, so I'll be looking at um, maps defined on the unit disk. So we have B, which is, in this case, just a set in C. <coughs> and then I'll be looking at uh, maps that take a unit disk into itself. So we have psi, which is holomorphic, takes a unit disk into it itself. But I want to, it to be a strict contraction. Now, that, what does that mean? I actually also want to have a continuous extension to the boundary. So this can be formulated nicely by saying that it's also a C0 map extended to the boundary to the closure of D, and the values should be inside D. So this is what I call a uniform contraction. And what we do is that we want to take functions living on the disk and then compose with this map. So we need to specify a little bit what, we can, what kind of function space we would like to look at. And actually, it's, it's, um, it's not very rigid. You can actually, there's a lot of choice. So here, I'll take one function space. Uh, sometimes it's denoted by A of D. Sometimes there's an A infinity D, whatever. This is, you take, uh, you take an um, analytic function again on the disk. What you ask to have continuous extension to the closure. And this given uh, soup norm is a nice balance space. So you put a soup norm on, on this, and then we've got a balance space. And the operator then will act in the following way that I take a phi here, and I'll simply say that L, L uh, phi of Z will be defined to be phi composed with psi of Z. And this is defined for z in d. Now it also extends to z in d power because of the hypothesis. And it actually maps this space into itself. So um, now this is uh, a linear map, so you may also wonder about sort of the eigenvalues of this. And to consider eigenvalues of this, um, you would like to say decompose into this way, except you have need infinitely many terms. So um, how do you do that? In this case, you can do it by hand. So let me do it. You write L phi of Z. It's a composition with this uh, side set, which is a contraction of the unit disk. So we can recover the value here by simply looking at a Cauchy integral. So we can take a Cauchy integral here along the boundary of the disk. And then we take phi of u, u minus psi of z. So if you know the Cauchy integral form, that is sort of a standard way to evaluate, say, this function at that point. 
Now, uh, Xi of Z is smaller than u, and u has actual value 1, so you can simply do a von Neumann expansion of this. So it's the same as n. And what do we get? Well, uh, it's 1 divided by a minus x u. So we have these usual geometric series, and you get something like uh, Xi of Z power n. And then you will get the integral of what is remaining. So integral of phi of u divided by u n plus 1 du 2 pi r. <coughs> so still around the boundary of the unit disk. So what are the ingredients here? Well, the ingredients are that this function here is what I would call fn in this formulation. And what is written here would be the linear function acting. So all this would be the linear function Kn acting on phi. Now we are in different dimensions, so we have to be a little bit more careful now about talking about traces and determinants. But um, there's some work. Uh, in Hilbert spaces, actually, this was sort of known quite a lot before. In Banach spaces, it comes by work of only. In uh, uh, two papers, actually, in 55 and 56, one about something called nuclear spaces and the other about fraton determinants. And if you combine the two, you sort of get a how to handle the situation here. So what he tells you is that if, um, well, actually he says that an operator L is said to be nuclear of order Zero. Well, there's a general order P also, but let me take order zero. So let me write it, uh, L is nuclear of order zero. What does it mean? It means that if it has a decomposition like this, so what we're doing here, and then if for every P greater than zero, um, if you look at the norm of these this one-dimensional operator. So I take the norm of the one-dimensional operator, which means that I take norm of Fn, I take norm of Ln, so this is in x, this is in prime. Uh, usually, actually, in, in hyperspace theory, if this sum converges, then you say it's trace part. In balanced space, you need to be a little bit more careful. But it's nuclear of order zero if this sum here converges for all p positive. In our case, uh, this is in fact the case because what happens is that uh, xi of z is uniformly bounded actually, so it's smaller than the constant. So this actually goes exponentially fast to zero, whereas this here is just bounded. So exponentially fast to zero, raised to the power of p, everything <coughs> is fine, it converges for all p positive. And then uh, Golden Dick. It tells us that in that case, uh, the operator admits a trace. And it can be computed as before. So it means that you can compute trace of L to be the sum over N, Ln, Ln. And it admits a determinant. So determinant defined in the same way as here. Determinant of 1 minus S A, giving this formula here. And it's equal to product of 1 minus s times the eigenvalues. So you have all this stuff here, it carries over to this situation here. Trace plus determinant um, plus formula for the determinant. <coughs> in, in this case here, we can, uh, let me just do it by hand, carry, carrying out the trace. What is the trace actually? Well, um, what, what it means to trace is that you have to act with this functional on this function. So you have to substitute for phi this and carry out the sum. So what is it? It's integral of psi of z and uh, u u to the power n plus 1 du to pi i. And now we carry out the Neumann series in 
reverse. So this is simply, so you do the same thing, it becomes the integral of 1 divided by u minus psi of u, and u over 2 pi i. <coughs> and now there's one particular property when you have a contraction map of the unit disk, then it really contracts and it converges to a point if you iterate. There's actually just one fixed point. There's a unique fixed point here. Uh, there exists a unique, let's call it u star, <coughs> equal psi of u star. And furthermore, the fixed point must, must be attracting, meaning that the value of psi prime of u star is necessarily smaller than 1. So, uh, how do you carry out this integral then? Well, you look for when does it vanish in the problem, and you carry out some residue calculation. So, uh, you need to find out when is it zero, when it is, when it's, you have the fixed point. So, there's just one contribution from residue. Uh, which comes at u star, and you have to take the derivative of what is standing there, so it's 1 minus psi prime of u star. Okay, so now you have a trace, and you can also compute trace of L square, etc. It's actually all to do with this fixed point. So actually having one map is perhaps not uh, that interesting. So, uh, I mean, you can of course complicate this uh, situation quite a lot, but uh, you can also just take two maps, say, and we look at sum of composition operators. But I also plug in a little something that we call a weight, so sum of weight composition operators. So the idea is that you would take, we'll say, just for two operators, then you take the zero one. You would define LK phi of z to be some weight, k of z times phi converted psi k of z. So each psi k should be of the above above form. So these should be uniform contractions. And these here should just be functions living in our space. Actually, they do not really matter, matter very much for the analysis, so these should just belong to x. You compute the trace of L. So actually, this, it, the weight doesn't really matter so much. You, you put in the weight in, in the right place, and you see that you, it's the same residue. Trace of LK would just be GK of U star K. Oh. 1 minus psi prime k k star. So again, uk star is the unique fixed point of each of these contracting maps. And then uh, you carry out sort of, uh, you take the sum, L being the L0 plus L1, say, and the trace of that would just be the sum of the two. So, how does the frequent determinant then look at, like in that case? Well, it looks like, so let me call it D of S, determinant 1 minus S L, so let me write this 0 plus 1. Um, again, it will be a product of 1 minus S times eigenvalues, so if you know the 0, you can read off the eigenvalues. And at the same time, you have this formula, which is exponential minus S sum S to the N <coughs> times the trace of L0 plus L1 power N. Now, here actually comes in a little bit of dynamics uh, because when you develop this L0 plus L1 to the power N, then you get 2 to the N terms. Now, they correspond to some different compositions, orders of compositions of the two operators, so we get different six points. So these will, in dynamical systems, I'm not going to talk about that actually, but in dynamical systems that would correspond to periodic orbits 
of your map. So uh, these here will correspond to that you get two to the n fixed points of the n integral, which will come to um, periodic orbit of length n. Now this is all fine, but um, so I should say for a minute that all this um, and a lot more was initiated by Wern in '76 in a book on, uh, in a paper on data from some dynamical systems. And uh, he considered also higher higher dimensions and things get more complicated, but the upshot will be the same. Well, actually, it was on the board yesterday, right? I mean. So yeah, the formula I had in my talk, the high-dimensional formula, which yeah. works not only in the in the holomorphic category but also in the CR category, except that you don't have trace class anymore. Right. But just to make the connection, is this formula? Which is right. I mean, the, the same formula appears all the time in different with different definitions of the traces and in with different def uh, sort of uh, yeah difference in when it actually converges again. Like so once again. Uh, in this context, this is an entire function. This one obviously is not when it's written like this, but it has an extension as an entire function. And if you do the computations on the computer, you can actually find it out this and you get very nice convergence. Uh, now, uh, this needs, needs uh, uniformly contracting mass. Um, so it is that I want to stick in a little complication, which is I want to put in a map that will have a fixed point, which is not uh, contracting, but is just a neutral fixed point. So um, now this has actually been done in various contexts, but let me um, just give you one example. So I, I will not think of. Take the full generality. So I'll actually change the coordinates a little bit. I'll shift in my unit disk. Uh, so it is the complex board, one half, one half. So um, just to be concrete, actually. So you have one half here, you have zero here, you have one here. And the contracting map that I'm going to take is simply that I'm going to take this unit disk and then contract it to this. Now this you can do in several ways, but there's one way in which this fixed one, this becomes a fixed point and it becomes neutral. So this side zero, uh, in my case we just have the form z divided by one plus z. Now for the for the second map, Psi 1, I would leave that actually as just some contracting map. Whoops, um, This has not been used for some while. <laughs> actually, perhaps I have not used it. <laughs> Try this one. So I take some other Psi 1, but that's going to be a nice contraction real inside. And we'll have this one would correspond to some nuclear operator of order zero. The weights uh, for the weights let me also take the zero to be identically one to make life simple. And for the second weight, you can take uh, whatever you want. Okay. So uh, what happens then? Well, obviously the analysis breaks down because you're supposed to divide by zero at some point. And somehow that's not allowed. Uh, now, I think the first uh, to actually consider this kind of situation, I think that's the uh, Hilbert and Sloane. They have two papers, first one in 91. Well, they start looking at this situation, but then uh, they want to say something about the spectrum of this operator that you would define with these maps. Now, um, what happens is that the L0 operator, say L0, phi of z, is in this case simply just composition with this phi of z divided by 1 plus z.
Now, the only thing you can say if you do, don't do anything else is that this is bounded. Well, it's actually bounded by 1. So the norm of L0 is, um, well, in this case, actually equal to 1 in all space. In other words, uh, what can you say about the, the spectrum of L0? Not much more, actually. The spectrum must be inside the unit disk. So, spectrum of L0 must somehow sit inside the unit disk. Um, so, their formulation was slightly different, but you may then, if you reformulate what they did, you may ask, what about uh, spectrum outside the unit disk? Can you say something about that? And the point is, that yes, you can. Um, so, how do you do that? Well, suppose now that, and now I actually changed a little bit variables so and look directly at the spectral values. Suppose lambda is not in sigma of L0. Okay? Then when is lambda in um, the spectrum of L0 plus L1? Okay, so outside the unit disk, when is it actually? So let me write it here. So um, lambda is in the spectrum of L0 plus L1. And let me in fact say it's not in. So I want to look at the regular points. What does it mean? Well, it means that as lambda minus L0 plus L1 is invertible. Now, this is sort of what we have been looking at. Uh, we just calculated the freedom determinant and then said when it when with, with 0, then it would not be invertible. But here, L0 is not nuclear. Now, the trick is that um, lambda is not in the spectrum of L0. So you will factorize lambda. So this is, if I know you, you will factorize this by taking this out. So, mm -hmm. so lambda minus L0 minus 1, L1. All you need is that this product here is invertible. So this exists by the hypothesis that lambda is not in the spectrum of L0. Now, um, I didn't mention actually, but if you look at the formula for the nuclear operators, uh, it's actually an ideal sitting within the space of operators. In fact, if you look at, say, the Gordon Dick formula there, if you plug in an uh, operator before or after a bounded linear operator, well, it doesn't change, it just becomes a constant. It's just a multiplicative constant. So, it, what it means is that if this is nuclear, then this is also nuclear of order zero. In other words, um, in order to check that this is invertible, all you need to check is that this here is invertible, this you knew. So, in order to check that, well, that, for that we do have a, our freedom determinant. So, this is if and only if determinant of lambda of 1 minus lambda minus L0 minus 1 L1 is different from 0. Now, how do you compute this then? <coughs> Um, a little algebra. And you realize that actually this here, so let me call this regularized determinant. Um, let me compute it just what does it look like? Because now I have, if you want to change variable, actually, I'm looking at the lambda rather than the s. The relationship is just that s is 1 over lambda. So you get this formula very similar to this. And it becomes like lambda to minus n because of what I just said. And then the traces will be again L0 plus L1 to power n. Now that wouldn't be good because this is not trace, trace class, but this little trick here actually 
just make this being subtracted. So we have n0 plus 1, l1 to power n, minus n0 to power n. All this, you take the trace of this, and like this. If you look at this, every element of this here, what is remaining, this is actually trace cards. Because every one contains at least one factor L1, which was in the pair. So this is fine, and it corresponds to saying that you're looking at all periodic orbits in dynamic system context, all periodic orbit of length n, except the neutral fixed one. So this is also computable. And then you may, if, in fact, uh, look at what the spectrum looks like. And, and you may get some picture. And for this, I would probably change the So now we get to the <coughs> part here. So if you look at the spectrum of L0 plus L1, what can we say about it? Uh, well, you can say that uh, after this analysis that we have here, we can say that, um, well, it may contain anything inside the unit disk. We have no idea what's going on. So this is B. And then you may have um, some eigenvalues outside. So what I didn't mention is that this regularized determinant here is actually an analytic function in lambda. So it's analytic outside the unit disk. So lambda, d bar complement, mapping to d regularized determinant of lambda is in fact analytic. And it has some decay rate at infinity. Tends to one active. So, what happens is that if you have a stereo of this, then it has to be isolated. And even more, what happens is that zeros of E rate are in one one correspondence with eigenvalues of our N0 plus L1. <coughs> what I showed you was actually just that. Um, if you have an eigenvalue, you will have a zero, and if you have zero, you will have an eigenvalue. But it also holds for multiple <coughs> eigenvalues. The, the degree of the zero corresponds to the multiplicity of the eigenvalue. Anyway, the picture is the following. You might have some isolated eigenvalues, something like this. And they might actually accumulate onto this. One doesn't have any idea of what's going on when you approach the, what you would call the essential spectral radius or possible essential spectral radius for this case. So, and uh, now um, a Japanese um, mathematician, Michiru Shijikuo, he is working in complex dynamics. Um, so in 91, he came up with something very interesting, which was 
how to treat neutral fixed points in complex dynamics. So here's what in complex dynamics, but I'm trying to have some relation with it. And what he said so about... Can I just interrupt? I'm a bit confused. I mean, so in this notation, the zeros are the same as the eigenvalues. Yes. Like one over the eigenvalues. Exactly. But I thought the eigenvalues were inside the unit. No. Okay. Sorry? Okay. So, so in this context, L0 has radius 1. And you don't know what's going on with L0. Yes. So uh, you don't know what's happening with eigenvalues inside. Okay. Um, so he, he was um, looking at how to treat neutral fixed points in complex dynamics. And his idea was to, um, for neutral fixed point, so if P is a neutral fixed point, for some map. And then um, his idea was to take this neutral fixed point and then map it to infinity. So map P to infinity. And then at the same time, you would do something nice to this, this uh, fixed point map. At the same time, you can ensure that you may conjugate psi zero to a shift map. Now, I'm going to give a very precise definition of what, uh, what is going on in this context. But in my example, I'll tell you what's going on. So this is almost dry. So, um, in our context, we have this, uh, I'll take really the map up there. So we have this disk from centered at one half, radius one half, and zero was a fixed point. So this you would like to map to infinity. And how do you do that? You take eta of that, you call this w, and in this context, you can take 1 minus z divided by z. Okay, so what happens to our. Um, so you have 0 here, 1 half, 1 here. On the eta, uh, well, actually, 1 is going to be mapped to 0. 0 is going to be mapped to infinity, and 1 half is actually going to be mapped to 1. So these three points will actually map to 0, 1, and then infinity sitting on there. The disk will be mapped to a disk in the complex plane, or generalized disk, meaning a half plane in this case. And simply this half plane here. Now, what you do is then that you conjugate. Do you mean real, not real? Yes, yeah. But you mean real, yeah. I'd like to look at this direction. So, let's, let's conjugate the invariant. So, anyway. um, so, what about our map S of W? So you have to kind of get back and forth, so it will be something like eta composed with psi zero, composed with eta minus one of w. You do the calculation, and in this particular case, you get right at the shift map, which is just adding one. Um, I would just say that in, if you are not in this lucky situation with a Möbius transformation, then in general, you do not just get one, so you do need to do something extra, which is like 
quasi-conformal maps and uniformization theory, and that's actually what Shichikura did and became very famous for that. I just pick up this word, uh, word and then I use the same in my context. But in our case, we can do the same, and in this particular case, we actually just get the shift map. So here we have the shift. And then you look at what happens to this other map, the Xi1 we have there. Well, Xi1 was just mapping inside here. You conjugate, it's going to be map somewhere in here, Xi1 of H. So actually, I'm going right to the new coordinate. So Xi1 should perhaps put a little twiddle on it because it's the conjugate of Xi1. Okay. Now, why is this actually good? Well, it's because you can start thinking of other kind of function spaces. Here, I was just looking at um, polymorphic functions continuous on the boundary. But in this case here, actually, on the shift map, you have some extra possibilities. So in particular, say the right function space in this case um, seems to be something like, well, actually, you can take any LP space on the boundary of H. So, you take in two functions here, and you take functions that are analytic in H plus, and they have to have some decay at infinity. And you can do the same analysis as uh, Sloane and Prelper did, and you would get the same picture. That's no problem. However, this happens to be <coughs> isomorphic to another space, which is just L2 function in the R plus. It's given by a Fourier transform, or the plus transform if you want. But uh, if you take functions in L2 on R plus, <coughs> so if you have phi hat here, then you may reconstruct phi by simply, simply writing phi of w, that would be integral from 0 to infinity. And what do we have? We have exponential of minus w t psi phi hat of t dt. So it's your first space and the hard space. So it's the, it is the hard space, right? Yeah. So uh, this is a Harley space, and then this is just the dual of that, or the isomorphic representation, just using R plus. Now, my operator then, which was L0, well, it corresponds to composition with this operator, with this function now. So my L0 in this representation, so I could put in some hats. Yeah, let me do that. L0 hat, what would it do to this? No, that's actually it's zero, sorry. It was in zero of W. Well, it is just phi of W plus one. So if you plug in here, you get integral zero infinity, e to the minus, well, you get W plus one T. So we're going to rewrite this as WT, e to the minus T, by head of T, dt. E So now you see that um, this operator here is simply conjugated to a multiplication operator by e to the minus t. So if you call, say, let me call that the zero hat perhaps, uh, phi hat of t, in e to the minus t, phi hat of t, this time for t positive, would be the conjugated operator. So what is the spectrum of this operator? Exercise for the class. No one. Zero one interval, right? So we have actually reduced the spectrum of this L0 that was a little bit annoying to something very simple, just the segment zero one. So the spectrum now of L0 hat is just zero one. So the image of e to the minus t, if you want the closure, 
of e to the minus t, t to the zero. So, so the picture is now that uh, we have reduced this a little bit. This is uh, my job in 99. So you erased all the eigenvalues outside the unit circle, right? Because now that you change the space, they're not there anymore. I think that's why I was confused. Actually, the eigenvalues outside the unit circle will not move because they are series of the same determinant. So what happens is that when you calculate the determinant, you get the same expression. Uh -huh. So if you're changing the space on which you're living, but the determinant actually is calculated still by some or a parent orbits of some uh, derivatives. So what happens is simply that now we can get, go a little bit closer and we see that now we have this here as the spectrum of n zero. And then you can say that our determinant, well, it might have some zeros here. Okay, so zeros let me ask the question differently. If you take the usual weight, I'm not sure that's what you're doing, but one over the derivative. The spectrum of L0 plus one, L1 is in the unit disk. No? Ah, okay. Uh, so that's why I was confused. Ah, sure, okay, okay. Right? Oh, right, okay. Okay. I see what you mean, yeah. But, so okay. I, but actually, I'll take any weight on sure, one. Sure, okay. Now I understand. Thank you. So now we have that deregularized of lambda. It's actually analytic um, from C, actually including infinity if you want, minus the unit segment, and then uh, to C. So, um, the question is now, what can happen when you go get close to the segment 0, 1? Again, we don't know. It's kind of essential spectrum, so you have, could have accumulations of zero towards that. We don't know. Except that you might find a little trick. And I think I can just talk about that trick. going to take, instead of this half plane here, I could actually choose to take the half plane sort of a little bit tilted. So I could replace it by, for alpha small at least, I could replace h by h alpha, which would be h in fact times e to the i alpha. So, I will look at is here. And so this would correspond to zero. I still have my map, my shift map, which is the same. Uh, and then I will look at what happens when I look at the Hardy space corresponding to this segment here. So my psi 1 of h alpha is also going to change a little bit. Alpha small won't change too much. So it will be perhaps something like this. So I run H alpha. Okay. Now, if you look at the Hardy space corresponding, that means that actually you're looking at some complex values that goes a little bit skew in the complex plane. Now, the isomorphic variant of this uh, would be actually to have the same formula as this, except that here actually you should go in the complex plane a little bit sort of tilted the other way. So instead of looking at t going in the real axis, real positive axis, you should actually let t 
go a little bit tilted that way. So the isomorphism would be, more precisely, that you should take L, so phi of, phi of W, would in this case be integral of E to the minus W, but because you tilt it, you have to tilt back like this. And then we have phi hat of T, dt. If you plug in the same thing with this here, you will get the same thing here, except that what actually? Well, except that this here would be located by e to the minus t, but times is e to the minus alpha. Okay, so L0 will be conjugated to the following operator, which is e to the minus t times e to the minus i alpha, so all this in the exponent, times phi hat of t, and actually here t is simply real and positive. And then I ask you the same question to the class. Uh, what is the spectrum of this operator here? It's a set of e to the minus t and t minus i half from zero and infinity. That sounds good. <laughs> I'll accept that as a problem. So um, I think it's also called a logarithmic spiral. Isn't it? So the spectrum here actually corresponds to something that goes from one and then does something like this. So what does it mean for my fretum determinant? My, once again, the fretum determinant is still the same, calculated the same way, same choices. So it means that my fretum determinant must be analytic in the complement of this domain. It means that my fretum determinant, I can actually make analytic continuation. So, that's how I how do you say When you cross, crossing, crossing this segment zero one. Now, zero and ones, they are fixed nasty values. I cannot get rid of them. But zero and one, the open interval, I can go across. I can also go across in the other way. You take alpha negative, that's fine. How far can I go? Well, there is yet another trick that I can really explain, but it is that, uh, well, actually, I can, I can shift this back a little bit further. Because, you see, when I start taking alpha very big, then these two guys might meet. And that's bad. If they meet, I, I cannot do anything. But there's a trick which is that I can actually shift this a little bit further back. Well, there's some residue, um, uh, resolvent identity you use to show that you can actually do that. So you can actually take alpha as big as you want as you stay below pi half. So it works for for all alpha smaller than pi half. Now when alpha goes to pi half, what happens here? Well actually it will just turn more and more so slowly spiral. Which means that uh, your analytic consummation, well, you can do it actually like this, and you can do it in the other way, like this. So the fretum determinant that I constructed actually has an analytic continuation to the complex plane, where along the slit 0, 1, you will glue a logarithmic say, spiral going one way, and along the other slit, something going the other way around. Now, um, what happens, I mean, is it really sort of a, an essential gluing process? Well, numerically, well, I don't know actually analytically, but numerically, I tried to calculate this, and it looks as if you get different values when going from one side to the other side. So it seems to be real sort of things going on. But in principle, my D, that's sort of the conclusion that D is regularized, is analytic. On, uh, you take C minus 0, 1, but then you glue um, along 
um, zero one open. You glue actually what you glue actually you glue an, a universal cover of the D uh, of the pointed disk. So let me write it um, D star. So you take the pointed disk and then you look at the universal cover which corresponds to these spirals going up and down. And um, this is as far as I've got up to now. And uh, then uh, the idea is that, uh, but that's my future work, is to find, use more symmetries of this map that I haven't sort of yet talked about, to perhaps get in functional equations, and then perhaps get a beyond these uh, and capturing something interesting in that context. So, thank you very much for your attention. We have time for some questions. Yes, maybe, maybe you won't comment that because it is at linearity of order zero, but basically this quadratic formalism also works, I think, at some ability of two thirds or something, but up to something like this. So all this machinery also you know, doesn't need this regularity as much. Maybe. It was just because you're always um, going back to look now for the zero. Right, yeah. This is really and I'm also like, confused a little bit with um, this expansion, yeah, because mm -hmm. um, basically this expansion cannot have zeros unless you have a pole, right? In, a positive pole inside the sum. <coughs> so, I mean, I'm just confused because when you have zeros with larger values of lambda and absolute value, then you know that. I'm not sure exactly what I mean. Because, I mean, this, the thing in the, inside the exponential lab. <coughs> Only converges for lambda large. Yes. So we have an so constellation so inside. So you mean you have some? So there's some larger radius. Yeah. Up, up to the end, and, and then there are no, no, no zeros. It's anymore. a little bit like that. You have so exponential. If lambda really large, and then That's there will be no zeros. Okay. If you take something like lambda to minus n over n, so if I'm not mistaken, this would be just. Uh, something like uh, log of uh, one minus one minus one. No, no, one minus 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 one one but the exponential of this actually has a little continuation and it gives you a nice. Yes, right, that is, uh, yes, 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 yes. But, but, but there you, you, your, your pole is at 1, right? In a way. Mm -hmm. and well, uh, in this particular case, there's because only. Like, I think to the there's pole only. Minus one. Yeah, so you have an eigenvalue at 1, in this case, if it was like this. Yes. And then I have a. Um, yeah, but this is fine, this is what, what was said, that you don't have actually eigenvalues not just in 1. Ah, and so you, you're asking about 1. No, no, because. Well, it depends on the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but, but still, this exponential cannot converge, right? It will break down. I mean, when you have a zero there, you, you must have, have a positive I think, pole. But, but I think it's the same as this kind of thing you are asking for. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's just because it's, it's lambda is in the complement of the unit disk. So and then still, you're saying you, you have some sort of. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe yeah. I'm confident. Basically, there are no eigenvalues no, no outside of zero disk. If you, I mean, if you are allowed to take lambda in the, uh, in the complement of the unit disk, for the exponential yeah. zeros to converge, there cannot be something. The exponential will not be zero. I mean, Meaning uh, there will be no zeros in the determinant. So mm. Say this here, it converges. Um, well. It converges when the, the traces here, I mean, you have this uh, radius of convergence determined by this is the the of traces. Of the so, but now it depends on what I take for L1. Uh, as you were saying, I mean, I'm, in this context, I can take for L1 anything that just is nuclear. Mm -hmm. And this works. Uh, yeah. And you may have eigen, a lot of eigenvalues all over the place. And, uh, so. Yes. Yeah, in some sense, I agree. I just don't agree really with the locations of the mm -hmm. but except, yeah. but the formalism works in some sense. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Um, in a certain sense, 
the ideas revolve around uh, finding a connection to a dynamical zeta function. Now, in some, in some favorable cases, the dynamical zeta function might allow a reinterpretation of the left shift zeta function. And the last thing you, you told us kind of smells a little bit as if there were some other left shift type formula in the background that would allow you to see these various branches as the mm -hmm. result of some uh, uh, index theorem. Has, has somebody, or is this, this the wrong idea? It's a very good idea. Well, you only have contractions. I mean, is it the left shift? Mm -hmm. Well, the mention one, right? You can only have contractions. So I think the index is kind of. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't know actually, but I mean, there's certainly there's something about, say, here we're talking about fractal determinants. And it's true that actually, if you look at, um, if you look at the dynamic theta function, I haven't talked about it, but you sort of do the weights a little bit differently. You, you, the traces are kind of different, you would say. Uh, then you might get um, some nicer behavior around one. But for instance, in this case, we look at the theta function. I think that one would be something like log one minus uh, lambda minus one. Uh, in, in some case, it would have that kind of behavior. It, it is slightly nicer, but still, um, no, there's something wrong. But there's also the civil, I mean, there's some kind of logarithmic uh, branch cut in the theta function. Uh, but that might be artificial for the theta function, actually. So there's, there's something which is why it's extremely difficult to, to go across this branching curve and say something. And it might be different things you can say if you look at theta function than for the determinant. So, but I, I do not know, actually, I haven't started how to continue the theta function. Yeah. Yeah. Just I mean, for the notes, because you have a neutral fixed point, usually one induces on this neutral fixed point. One induces on this to make it then get a uniform. I mean, that, that, that's, this is maybe just a, is that's, of course, that's, that's of course cheating, right? But, but you know, I mean, the, the usual thing that you do with the ferry map, uh, so I'm looking at the spectrum of the, say, of the operator associated with the ferry map, you know, say, and uh, I'm just looking at that. And the typical way to do this in dynamic systems, and of course for dynamics, it's very good. It is that you induce on one part of it and you get the Gauss map. And the Gauss map, well, it has some other small problems, but you have a very nice invariant mesh or something like that, and you have some spectrum, you have a lot of things. But you have renormalized the time, mm -hmm. so you're not looking at the same operator activity. Exactly. And so that, that makes a difference between what I've been looking at and then front is Exactly, so this is really a different. Point of view. It's very different, I guess. And I, I personally, and I, I haven't, I, I'm too blocked up to the administration right now, so I don't have the time. But I'm, I think there's a lot of symmetries in this that uh, you don't see in the, in the course map, actually. And I expect that there might be interesting stuff going on. So I'm just going to discuss. So for the uh, ferry map, when you do this, how's the relation between this regularized um, determinant and the zero zeta function? Ah. I haven't calculated the actually, but, but it, that's also a good question, I think. And in particular for the Ferrari map, you have a lot of symmetry, so... Okay, good. So now I think we thank the speaker one more time.